Let me warmly welcome you at the Aurea Institute and the Austrian Academy of Sciences. Well, and I'm really glad um, that we are hosting this exciting conference about genes, isotopes, and artifacts. Because I think we are living now in exciting times in archaeology and the study of the human past generally. The new bioarchaeological methods are constantly, at the moment, open up new perspectives and offering fresh and dynamic input and are also challenging our old and traditional concept of archaeology in many ways. Some in our community are even speaking about a paradigm change in the complete academic discipline of archaeology, such as it happened uh, a while ago with quantum physics or molecular medicine. Others in our community even believe in ancient genomes and isotopes as being the best and neutral source for analyzing human history. And some are even suggesting to hand over the study of the human past to the geneticists. Well, in Vienna, we are currently celebrating the jubilee of 140 years of prehistoric research at the Austrian Academy of Sciences. What is demonstrating the long tradition of our discipline in Vienna? But I would like to po point out that from the founding in 1878 onwards, the interdisciplinary approach was essential. Archaeology, anthropology, geology, etc., worked together from the beginning, strongly linked. Prehistory was understood as a science, a natural science, and therefore also settled up in the mathematical, natural, in the mathematical natural sciences branch of the Austrian Academy. Lots of new methods have been developed in these last 140 years but probably none of them led to a scientific impact as expected now by ancient DNA and genome decoding and next generation sequencing, except maybe radiocarbon dating. Fortinsy chronology represents a standard method today, but not only underwent heavy debates in our field, but also methodological developments and changes in its application during the last decades. And it's in my view worth to keep this period of interdisciplinary of the second half of the 20th century in mind when we are now facing the, the gold rush, the genetic gold rush in archaeology. No doubt, these are exciting days in archaeology. And I would like to congratulate the organizers, Claudio Cavazzuti, Katarina Reba Salisbury, and Benjamin Roberts for bringing you all to Vienna and to create this fantastic conference program. And I hope we will crucially debate the methods and the input and the outcome of this revolution now in archaeology. Thank you very much and welcome. Thank you everybody for coming. Uh, despite the cold, the winter, the storm, I know that there have been some problems for the flights. So uh, you have proven that you know, mobility can happen despite uh, everything. Um, so I have to thank all the, all the sponsor of this conference, which is the, the OREA, the Austrian Academy of Science, the Archaeology Department of Durham University, and uh, the Fritz Thyssen Stiftung, and of course, our host of the Austrian Academy of Science. So thank you for making this happen. Yes. So why doing a conference on mobility in Bronze Age Europe? For three main reasons. One, because mobility is more and more parts of people's life, and we believe that scientists in general have the duty of reflecting on human dynamics in the long period, in the antiquity as well as today. Yes, no, it's not this one. Yeah. <laughs> Second, because human mobility in European prehistory has traditionally been identified through artifacts rather than people. So 90% of what we know about prehistory is due to this approach on artifacts. So thanks to isotopes and ancient DNA studies, we have now the possibility to see people behind artifacts 
and to go beyond generic or neutral categories such as contacts between A and B for explaining human relationships. We can now see how individuals or even masses moved and transformed places and societies. And third, innovation are of course welcome, but every innovation needs a long and patient, patient labor lima, not just of techniques and methods, but also on a, an epistemological level. So archaeologists, biogeochemists and geneticists, we are working on the same subject, which is the human past, of course. But do we really understand each other? Can we finally develop a common language? And above all, are we sharing the same attitudes, goals and awareness? But let me go back to the first point. Mobility is part of our lives and is an essential trait of contemporary society. Mobility has become so popular and pervasive primarily because economy and society have been changing in the last century. We have been moving from a production system based at 60% on agriculture in 1800 to a system based on industry and services. Services and capitals can be easily and quickly transferred throughout the globe. Raw materials, machines and industry can be displaced as well, although it's a bit more problematic. The only thing that cannot move is land itself. And in my opinion, what, is, what we are experiencing now is a real clash between the tendency to move and the attachment to places. And last month, two big demonstrations took place in Turin. I don't know, maybe you've heard about it. Both gathering more than 50,000 people. One in the left was in favor of the construction of, a, of the high-speed train line connecting the two cities of Lyon in France and Turin in Italy. And the other, on the right, it was totally against it. This is a good example, and I'm pretty sure we could think uh, of many more examples around the world, of how European society is now divided. Divided between those who believe in a globalized, interconnected world, where borders may be easily crossed, and those who see this openness as a threat to physical places, a threat to environment, and to the authenticities of local cultures and economies. A serious challenge to landed property, private or collective, with no effective protection from the good old nation state. Even tourism is now a problem in certain places, such as Venice, Barcelona, or Mallorca. And obviously, climate change and political crisis triggering mass migration from developing countries are complicating the framework. Part of the society believes that the immigrants can save the old world, which is actually getting older and older in terms of demography. And for the other part, they represent another actual threat to salaries, private property, and cultural identity. So was the Bronze Age similar to all this? What was the level of conflict between these two tendencies to move and the attachment to places? Isn't it a fil rouge that connects the third and second millennium dynamics with today's world? Archaeological material, genes and isotopes point to an unprecedented mobility occurring in this phase. We will hear about, uh, about it today and tomorrow, so mass migration and flows of people have been identified by the ancient DNA sequencing in various areas of Europe. Everybody knows. Long distance trade and mobility of artisans is evident looking at the distribution of bronze, ingots, amber, specific type of weapons and ornaments, specific ceramic types and so on. Mobility of women is another key factor for creating networks and reinforcing alliances. The example of the two Danish women is striking, but there are also other studies that have demonstrated massive use of exogamic practices. Beside all this mobility, at least from the early Middle Bronze Age, monumental defensive structures appear in the landscape, emphasizing their stable presence on the territory and the need to control people's movements. And I'm pretty sure that even if we are going to discuss mobility today and tomorrow, we will also see this opposite tendency. So we hope 
that you will enjoy the conference and participate to the discussion. So thanks again for coming. Uh, just uh, a couple of words from me. I wanted to try and set the tone of debate. We have many, many senior scholars, as well as many emerging scholars in the room, but you're all from very different disciplines, some of you from very different regions with very different backgrounds. The purpose of our two days is very much debate. We could present all of our papers and not talk to each other, uh, completely ignore what the other is saying, but I don't think this will get us very far indeed. So, what I would like you to think about is not that you're presenting to other ancient DNA or isotope or archaeological or regional specialists, but you're actually presenting to a much broader audience. And so when you're actually drawing your big arrows on maps about mobility, to actually say what you mean by mobility, what scale of mobility or what type of mobility you're talking about. And if you don't know or you're not sure, that's fine. Trust me. Most people in this room probably don't have the clearest idea of exactly what sort of mobility their data is telling them, but they might at least have some idea about what it's not telling them and what it might be telling them. So please feel free to be as clear and honest as you can uh, with your data and open yourself up to discussion and debate. With this in mind, uh, we're asking speakers if they are happy to be filmed. Um, part of this is the fact that these events are very rare. If you try and Google, uh, the topics that we're discussing today, the crazy stuff you get turning up on Google, <laughs> and at least on the first five pages, after five pages I gave up, essentially uh, indicates that on the internet, the subject that we debate, the subject that we study, is actually not well represented at all. If there's at least some decent free to access content up there, uh, then we're starting to make a bit of difference and all the crazy conspiracy theorists racists and other random commentators can some hopefully be slightly further relegated down the list. Uh, so if you are able to, um, with the filming we can film you and in post-production we can edit or blank certain slides if you wish, that's certainly possible and so thinking about those potential permissions can come at a later date. Anyway, with that in mind, uh, I'd like to echo my thanks to uh, my co-organisers, especially uh, Claudio, Katerina and Barbara, um, and uh, wish you all a fantastic conference.